David filled observer from the roof who becomes David the psalmist again. Wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. He should have been zapped off the roof. Peter denied Christ three times and became the foundation stone for the church. That doesn't make any sense. He should have been thrown aside for denying Christ. The thief on the cross was hell bent, literally hung out to dry, and he became a saint and smiled and left the servant with joy. It doesn't seem right. Forgiveness of my sins? I don't understand it. God's grace is extended to us. You know, the whole story of the Bible is God does everything in his power to bring us to heaven, not send us to hell. God's grace is extended to us. There's not a single person in the New Testament who came seeking God and a new, a new life, a second chance, was ever turned away with a stern talking to and shame on you. All found God's grace. Continuously, he offers us grace. This grace is available again this morning, but the key element to God's grace is we have to seek it. If we want God's grace, and forgiveness. It has to be sought. It doesn't come automatically. This morning, I encourage you to seek God's grace. We deserve His judgment. That makes total sense. But He offers us grace instead. In Him we have redemption through His blood. Forgiveness of trespasses according to the richness of His grace, which He lavishes upon us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will. Actively seek God's blessing. Please, let's pray. Holy Father, your grace runs so counter to who we are as beings. We have fallen so deeply into carnal, selfish attitudes that we want vengeance. We want justice on our enemies and on those who offend us. It is beyond the pale for us to think of extending to them grace 
And yet that's exactly what you do to us and exactly what you expect us to do that. I know, Father, there are people sitting in this room who have yet to ask you for grace. I pray this morning that today might be the turning point. Today might be the moment where they realize they have a choice between justice and grace. <coughs> Punishment and forgiveness. <coughs> But it's on us to see you. You're here. Your hand is extended. It's on us to reach our hand upward and ask for that grace. I thank you, Father, for the offer of grace that never expires until we do. In the name of Jesus Christ. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, we know and do every Sunday. Please stand. Stand
the blessing of life itself and the breath that we have within us. Lord, we thank you for all these things that you do and, and who you are that you first us, uh, loved us beyond measure and now uh, send your son sacrifice all we have so we might have a relationship with you. We praise your name and offer these gifts that I can further your team in Jesus' name. <laughs>
Let's pray. Heavenly right, Father, thank you for the love you for each and every one of us. For us to be here this morning to be in your house. The Lord, we ask you to be with those that have medical issues, uh, have lost loved ones, give them a lift. And the Lord, be with those that have other issues, uh, unspoken, you know what they are. So, Lord, be with us now, be with us today, as we get to the place and uh, watch over us, Lord, and be with us. Heavenly Father, we just come to you today and we give thanks for being able to be in your house, Lord, and to be able to praise you and glorify you. And we thank you for your love and great mercy that's very bountiful. And uh, as we come to prayer, Lord, we pray for those that are, are not able to be here today, Lord, that uh, you may be able to be with them and speak to their hearts, Lord. Uh, we just uh, pray for those that are uh, shut in and uh, that uh, can't come, Lord, and uh, give them healing, mind, body, and spirit. We just thank you for being our Savior, Lord Jesus, and, and we pray your name and glorify you. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Father, I look at it to you this morning, and I am fully aware you know she's dying by inches. She has no hope of us at all this town. I just ask for your comfort and presence in her spirit and in her family, and strength for each day, hope for tomorrow. I pray, Father, for her that a door might be found, and she might be healed and restored to full life. In the here and now, I just again ask for your comforting presence in her soul as she lays there and struggles to get better. Thank you, Father, for blessing this church family and for guiding it and protecting it and being with it, and each individual member of it. As we strive to do your will and to be Jesus to rush for. And it's in name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, I was led back to the stumbling block issue series this morning. And uh I'd like to begin by kind of paying tribute to Pam. Uh, you know, she treats me like a god. She brings me a burnt off virtually every night about supper time. <laughs> that's, that's a good story. Um, I, I recently had my guitar stolen, and I think I told you that. But at the last minute, I decided not to change the number, not to report it, because the thief actually spent less than Pam does. Looking in the mirror the other night, she said, you know, I look old and fat and ugly. I could sure use a nice compliment right about now. I said, well, your eyes look good. <laughs> now, that's just a joke. It's just a joke. I apologize to Pam in advance. She is not old and ugly. You know that. And she's a very good cook. And she's a delightful support system for me. But I'm talking about something, and I needed to start by talking about mine. We're going to talk about marriage today. Marriage is a stumbling block issue. Once upon a time, young girls were taught that the best life they could possibly have was one where they grew up, learned the good skills, how to take care of a house and raise children, have uh, two or three or four children. After marrying a local boy, you had a good job. And raise those children, take care of the house, and then one day be a good grandmother. That was the ideal for many years. If you suggest that to a young woman today, you will be sneered at. You will be put in the nose that you consider women to be so inferior they can't do anything more than that. The cultural view of marriage has changed dramatically. It is astonishing to me how negatively marriage is viewed it is now 
probably the last option on most young women's lists. Christianity, the Bible, Jesus, Scripture has one view of marriage, but the culture has an entirely different view of marriage, and thus it certainly qualifies as a stumbling issue. Today's message is entitled, Should I Get Married? And by, I hope by the end of a lesson, you will have a Christian answer to that, and a science answer to that. Now, on the surface, it may seem like a relatively easy question to answer. It depends on the individual. It's every woman's choice whether she wants to get married or not. It's a relative answer. But it's not quite that simple. We're going to spend this morning each time looking at the scientific evidence, the pros and cons of science. I'll get married, and then we're going to look at what Scripture has to say about getting married. I don't think this is going to be a shock to anyone, but the total percentage of people getting married in today's size, what do you think? you think that percentage is going up or going down? Yeah. It's going down. Only 53% of adults today have ever been married, at least, or have been married at least once. 53%. Uh, the number of adults living with an unmarried partner has risen from 3% to 7%. Now that doesn't sound like a very big deal, 7%, that's not very many people. Adjust that for age. Bring that down to 45 and under and ask the question. <clears throat> people ages 18 to 44, have you ever lived with an unmarried partner for at least a few weeks? The answer is yes, 59% of the time. 59% of all married adults have lived with somebody in an unmarried situation. <clears throat> Young adults are particularly accepting of cohabitation. 78% of the people between ages of 18 and 29, there is absolutely nothing wrong with living with an, another person that you aren't married to. And even across the entire society, across the entire spectrum of American society, every age group agree. A majority of people in every age group say, there's nothing wrong with sleeping, living, unmarried, cohabitating, that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. The answer only changes if you restrict the question to people who go to church. Then the percentage skews to marriage. Why? Do young people feel it's okay to cohabitate and not marry? As as with everything else, you can find the top ten answers, most frequently given answers to the question, why do you choose cohabitation over marriage? Number one, I just don't see the point. What's the point of getting married? Now the same thing on marriage you can have married. Number one is. Number two, I'm not interested until I've achieved certain goals in my professional career. That's the most common answer from females. Number three, seems to me that this is interesting. Seems to me that married people are fatter than and I like the way I look. There was my mistake. I got married. I was, I was really good until. Anyway. Number four, you have no control over the spending habits of your spouse. And that can lead to serious financial issues. I have a plan to build wealth. I sound like Elizabeth. I have a plan. I don't need anyone messing with my plan. <clears throat> Number five, getting married seems to me to be caving into the establishment. I like being in the independent rebel of society. I have past to be married. Number six, married people spend too much time Focusing on each other at the expense of their other friends. I like my circle of friends. I don't want to lose them. Marriage isn't worth the risk. Number seven. I think married people are too emotionally dependent on their spouses. That's just not healthy. I prefer to depend on myself. Number eight. Being in an exclusive relationship by marriage requires too much time and effort. Can I have an amen to that? I don't think that, I haven't met the girl in sports, but I, I doubt I ever would. Obviously, that's the most of the male answer. <laughs> Number nine, 
Most marriages end up in divorce anyway, so why go through the huddle up just to end up giving away half of everything I've worked for? Number 10. If I feel the overwhelming urge to do something like get married, I'll just do a civil union or a domestic partnership, which is far less complicated to get out of if things go to seven. <laughs> Can you believe that? Those are answers. Those are not just one individual answer. Those are the most 18 to 44. Why do they want to get married? There's one common theme to all 10 of them. Did you catch the common theme? This W-I-I-F-M, which stands for? What's in it for me? I don't want to get into marriage unless there's something in it for me. That's the common theme to all 10 answers. We're trying to answer the question, should I get married? As we have seen, teens and 20-somethings and 30-somethings say no. But I think if they looked deeper, which is where we're going to go this morning, if you look deeper into marriage and the reasons behind it, I think there's a lot in marriage for the individual. So let's begin by looking at the evidence of science. I want to bring science into here as much as I possibly can. We're all, we all give great credence to science. So what does science say about cohabitating <coughs> in marriage? Which is better or worse according to science? Well, the common knowledge among people under the age of 45, it's better in the long run to try out a relationship with cohabitation before you commit. And that doing so won't have any long-term negative effects. What does science have to say about that? Does science agree with that? Well, social science says it's a great thing to test drive a car before you go buy it, but that's not. Let me ask you this question. Which do you take better care of? The car that you rent at the airport for a week or the car that you're paying 400 bucks a month on? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You made a commitment to one and not to the other. And which one do you pay more attention to and take care of? You make attention and pay attention to take care of the one you made a commitment to. The same thing is true of relationships. <clears throat> Many couples think that moving in together will not affect their marriage. Do you know social science says couples who live together have a divorce rate 50% higher than people who don't cohabitate before they get married? Do you know that social science has determined every year you live together before you get a 10-year relationship by 20%? After five years of living together without getting married, you have 0% chance of getting to a 10-year relationship. Not my opinion. It is a fact of social science. Does living together lessen your chances of having a long-term relationship? It surely does. Many couples move in together, it's a lot cheaper to live two instead of one. And so finances are better, life is better if you move in together. Well, a lot of arguments end up being centered on my money, your money. People who cohabitate, they keep separate checking accounts, right? And they have separate expenses. And they argue about whose expense that is and whose expense that is. And we shouldn't be spending you shouldn't be spending your money like that because that, that, they have all kinds of arguments about that. One of the first things that I learned when I went to the counseling school was teach your kids to remove the words mine and yours out of their vocabulary when they get to the altar. You know why? Because there ain't no mine and yours anymore. It's just ours. But in a cohabitating relationship, it's one of the biggest determining factors to a split is always looking at things as mine and yours. It's a common myth that married couples, unmarried couples, have better sex than married couples. But what does social science say about that? Social science says frequency goes down, quality goes up when you get married. It is a statistic that's been in effect across decades and generations. Our commitment, our children, our jobs, they lessen the time that we have. When we were dating, we just devoted a lot of time to each other. But when you come to marriage, satisfaction goes up. 
Another common statement shared by young people is, all oh, marriage is just a piece of paper, and that's all it is. That meaning it's just a legal thing. It's just a legal contract, it's no big deal. What does social science say about that? It's not a legal thing, it's a commitment. It's a commitment. And that's a big deal. Psychologically, emotionally, physically. Another human being has said, I don't want to be with any of the other billions of women in the world. I just want to be with Pam. What does that say to Pam? Doesn't that make her feel special? It sure as heck makes me feel special that she just chosen me over billions of other men and never looks at another man. It's a commitment. It means something. It changes us. It changes our relationship. Many young people think that cohabitating for a short time <clears throat> will help, that, that they will end up getting married. And 60% of those living together will not end up getting married. 39% will break up and 25% will just keep doing what they do. How about kids? Is it better for kids to live in a house where people cohabit or better to live in a house where people are married? What do you think? Social science has an enormous amount of information on that subject. It's overwhelmingly in favor of kids living with their biological mother and biological father in a married situation. There are enormous negative consequences to living with people that isn't part of your biological parents. All right, let's turn from the negative and look for the positive. Is there any positive information that marriage is better than living together? Well, actually, there are six of them. I'm going to briefly take through them. This comes from the Pew Research Center's American Trends Panel Study Number Two. I'm not the only I don't make these things up. I have solid background. Number one, <clears throat> married adults have higher levels of relationship satisfaction and trust. You know that every successful relationship is built first and foremost on trust. Trust. Once trust is messed up, it's hard to have a good solid relationship. But in a married relationship, as opposed to a cohabitation, levels of satisfaction with their relationship. And what is that based on? Commitment. If you're just living together, any moment, any day, you could wake up and say, yep, sorry, Pam, I found something better, you're out of here. But being married is a commitment. Number three, when asked about specific aspects of the relationship, larger shares of married adults say they have no arguments regarding household chores, regarding uh, balances of work and personal life, how, way, how well they and their partner communicate, and their approach to parenting. <clears throat> Number four, married adults also are more likely than co-capitators to say they feel closer to their spouse. 78% of those surveyed said they feel closer to their spouse than any other adult. Only 55% of those people co-capitating said the same. And here's number five. This is one of the ones that I want you, and, and particularly the next group of people, but I want you to, to recognize this fact. This doesn't apply to the majority of my students. You want to be poor? You want to live in poverty? Don't graduate from high school. Get married. But have a child before you get married and live in cohabitation. This is a statistic. If you want to have money, graduate from high school, marry before having a child, and have your child after the age of 20. 79 not do that, grow up in poverty, and are in poverty for their entire lives. These are the, this is the number one indicator whether your children are going to get go to high, graduate from high school, whether they're going to have successful careers, whether they're going to stay married, in fact, whether they're going to reach the age of 25 or not. These three things determine more about a, a, a couple's success in life than financial success than anything else. Again, not so important to you guys, but to the next group, huge. All right? Marriage keeps people out of poverty. And finally, number six, marriage improves the quality and quantity of production. I read an interesting story. I did not know this. I'm an American history now, and I did not know this. 
1611, a group of investors sent colonists to Jamestown, Virginia. You all know that. But what you don't know is they didn't get any return on their investment for the first two years. They were expecting big money to come back. And nothing. They hired the investors, hired him, whose name is Sir Thomas Dale. Sir Thomas Dale. By the way, Sir Thomas Dale was a very good journalist, and all of his journals are available in, to, for you to read if you want to read about his journey. So he comes to Jamestown in 1612, and he starts observing what's going on. And the first thing he learns is the Indians have taught the men. There's no women in the colony, by the way, in the colony. The Indians have taught the men how to make rum. And the men brought their English bowling balls with them. And so what do you think they did all day? They bowled and bet on bowling and drank. They lived in squalor. They lived in the most rudimentary huts. They didn't plan anything. They only hunted the bare necessities to survive. And they spent all day drinking bowling and gambling. What do you think Sir Dale did to fix the problem? He went back to the investors in England and he said, <clears throat> we need to hire 150 women as soon as possible. And they offered women free passage and a free husband. Huh? How about that? They offered women a passage to America, a free husband and a fresh start and money to start on. And they had 150 women be a path to the ship. A year later, what do you think happened? There were very nice houses built. There were plants, crops growing. There were hard, uh, uh, animals harvested and tanned, and, and hides were going back to England. In one year, 150 women changed the course of American history. America's history changed because of marriage. All right, let's move to scripture. I spent a whole bunch of time talking about science and history. Let's talk about scripture. <clears throat> I was led to talk about four benefits to marriage according to scripture. Here's number one. It's found in Genesis 2.18. And then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I would make him a helper suitable for him. <clears throat> What is the point? What is the first thing that scripture teaches? We are designed to be in relationships. We're not designed to live alone. That was never else's intention. Now people read this scripture and they say, God made man, and then he felt sorry for man, and he made a woman to help man. But if you look at the language, the word that is in that sentence, it is not good for man. He's not a specific man. He is not a specific person with a certain set of words. That Hebrew word is humanity. And the translation should read, and then the Lord God said, it is not good for humanity to be alone. We need to be in relationship. <clears throat> and I believe that he said that the best relationship is in a committed, covenant relationship with a member of the opposite sex. Now, you know, God gave us an amazing tool to strengthen and keep our relationship together. You know what the tool was that God gave that makes our relationship work? It's a word you never hear in church. Sex. God gave us sex as a means of building and strengthening our relationship. Again, this sentence is more for the sex service than for you, but I'm going to say it anyway. Sex is not a toy. Sex is not a recreational activity. Sex is not given for your amusement. Sex is to keep a couple together. It's for two reasons, procreation and to bind a relationship together. That's the reason God gave us sex. And it is deeply bonded. <clears throat> I'm not going to look at anyone. But if you had sex with more than one person, the one that you remember the most is the first one. That's the way it's designed to be. Sex is an outside of an inward commitment. It is like marriage itself. It should never be about what we get, it should be about what we give. All right? <clears throat> Number two from Scripture. 
The second reason to be married in the scripture is it completes us. It makes us whole. You are only half a person when you're not married. What do I mean? Well, let me read the scripture first. All right? Matthew 19, 3 through 9. So Pharisees came to Jesus testing him, asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? He answered and he said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. The coming together to be one flesh is a reference to physical. Correct answer? Both. So you can't know God as a female without a male, and you can't know God as a male without a female. You can't, you aren't complete as only the half that you were born with. Now, don't, don't misread me or I'm not saying it's wrong to live alone. I'm not saying there aren't right circumstances that lead us to live alone. I'm saying that God designed us to be complete as a male-female couple. At least that's what Scripture teaches. We can't complete who we are or what we're supposed to be until we understand the opposite point of view. You cannot believe how many conversations I've had with pre, in, in pre-marital counseling, <clears throat> with guys in particular and with girls, and I say to the girl, what makes him think, or what, what is he, what's his approach to life, or, and I say to, to him, you know, what is this, and what's that, they got no clue. Just for instance, I say to the, to the women, I say, why do women talk? What are women trying to communicate when they talk? You know the answer? Feelings. Why do men talk? To communicate facts. That's the truth. And so you approach a conversation from two opposite directions. Women want to know, men, how do you feel? How do you feel? How do you feel? Men want to know, just give me the facts. Just tell me what the facts are. I don't need to know about her sister, brother, uncle, and what's the pressure. Yeah, I don't need all that. Just give me the facts. And so they don't talk because they don't understand the opposite sides of the fence. We need to be whole. We need to understand both sides. Marriage is the best opportunity to know God at the fullest because God is both male and female. <clears throat> Living with a loving Christian spouse, I think, completes us. And I think that is the God-given reason for marriage. Number three, I'm hurrying because we're really out of time. The third reason for getting married, according to Scripture, it is the best place to perfect Christianity. Hear me. I want you to remember that. Okay? Marriage is the best place to perfect Christianity. Here's the scripture. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What's the basic trait of Christianity? I've talked to this for three years. I've known it for seven. The basic trait of Christianity is? Love. And what kind of love are we talking about? Huh? Unconditional selfless love, which I have translated to you in a plain English sentence that is? What have I told you that love means? I will do whatever is best for you, regardless of what it costs me. When you are in a marriage situation, your goal, gentlemen, is to do what is best for her, regardless of what it costs you. There are certain circumstances where I will argue the other side of the fence. But most of the time, your job is to do what you need to do to help her feel well. And ladies, your job is to love him unconditionally. Can you imagine a relationship where each party does nothing but tries to give the other person exactly what they need all the time? Who would ever lead such a relationship? I will do what is best for you regardless of what it costs me. If you can't live out Christianity in a marriage, you can't live out Christianity anywhere. All right? There's not a single person in this room who hasn't said something or done something to their spouse that was mean and nasty and ugly. I know you did. All right? And so you have her around eventually and say, I'm sorry. Sorry, sweetie. I got a little cranked up. You know, 
My sugar was a little low, and I've said something really mean. And then the other has a choice. They can forgive and forget and move on, or they can hold on a grudge. They can hold and beat you with it every day. Christianity says forgive. Christianity says be calm. Christianity says be generous, not just with money, but with your emotions, with your time. No scorekeeping. If you can't live out your Christianity in a marriage, you can't live it out anywhere. It is the place to practice it. And then you take the model that you perfected there, and you take it to the workplace, and you take it into the neighborhood, and you take it everywhere else. Marriage is a perfect place to perfect Christianity. And finally, number four, <clears throat> Romans 15, therefore accept one another, just as Christ accepted us to the glory of God. Do you know one of the most basic needs of humankind is to be accepted? To be accepted for whoever you are or whatever you are. Now this is an instruction from Paul to the church to accept each other for who they are and where they are, but it applies to marriage as well. Now I, I know Pam is not going to remember this, but I remember it been many, many years ago. Pam and I were met another couple for dinner. And I came to work and she came from the house. And I arrived first and then the other couple arrived and then Pam came. And she sat down in the booth beside me, and she scooted up, and she held my arm. She leaned in and put her head on my shoulder. And the lady in the other couple said, oh, Pam, are you cold? And Pam's answer will live in my memory forever. She said, no, I miss Dave. I haven't seen him all day. Every one of us needs to be accepted, to be loved unconditionally. I know that no matter how miserable the sermon is, or how exhausted I am by Sunday, or how frustrated I am at not being able to meet everybody's needs and solve everybody's problems, which is a basic trait I have, that at the end of the day, Pam will be waiting to love me and accept me for who I am, as frail and fractured and flawed as I am. She loves me. We need to accept each other in Christian love, and in a marriage, you need someone who accepts you for who you are. How powerfully a thing it is to be accepted, no matter how miserable a human being you are. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects and trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never fails. Love is accepting another person. Many people in today's society view other beings as things. You're there for my use. I will use you when I'm done. I'll put you down and get another thing that will meet my needs. But people are not things. We are all created beings. We are all belong to God. We need to be treated the same. We need to be loved and forgiven and kind and generous to each other. This morning I was trying to teach four things from Scripture that I think are very important reasons to be married. Number one, marriage gives us the opportunity to achieve God's intended purpose for our lives, to be complete. Number two, our marriage gives us a chance to be complete, to know from both perspectives. Number three, marriage gives us the opportunity to practice and perfect our Christianity, and marriage gives us a partner who accepts us for who we are, regardless. And you will not find those things in a cohabitation relationship. He who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and for this reason a man shall his father or mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one, one flesh. They are no longer two, but one. Should I get married? Yes, you should. Amen. Holy Father, I thank you for the information, the truth that you have penetrated my heart with. And that is marriage is a very valuable thing that we should not cohabitate. We should not use sex as a toy. We should understand that we were given to each other and it is through a marriage relationship that we are the whole, complete human beings that you designed us to be. That we are intended to be together, male and female, two halves. Struggling to make a whole, to serve you, to serve a model to others. 
that this is what a loving Christian couple looks like. And it's a desirable thing. I pray, Father, that the words and the thoughts that you have put into my heart have penetrated the hearts of those who live and that they apply them to their particular situation. They understand what you want for their lives in this moment. Marriage is a good thing, given to us by you for your purpose. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Miss Kathy, let's go ahead and sing our last song. Please stand. <laughs> chosen one for each of us, that there is a perfect healthy for each person that you create, and whether we find it or not, it's most likely on us. But if we do, help us to keep that marriage alive and, and keep the relationship with you strong so that we can be a model of Christian love for the world around us. Bless us and be with us and protect the families and marriages of this country. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.